since it's recording, right? Okay. Um, welcome everybody. We're back to our uh, reading of Grossberg's book. There's a whole lot of vision in the middle of this book because I think a, a big chunk of Grossberg's um, reasoning was fleshed out and elaborated uh, in the visual modality, but it can be applied to other modalities pretty well. Uh, in that. And uh, so I thought I went through most of the three chapters that I mentioned in, in the email and um, I just sort of pulled out a few key ideas. Uh, it's tricky because zooming into how the model works can take a while and, and you kind of need to do it on your own anyway. But So I'm taking a leaf out of Ennio's book. So Ennio Mingola taught CN530, which was the vision course. And he himself said that I'm not going to be able to explain every little thing here. It's almost like an, an ad, like, like here are some things that, that happen. And once in a while you can kind of zoom in and um, uh, Elab uh, get some more detail. And sometimes you would ask and Enya would be like, no, you have to explain that to yourself. <laughs> um, so, but first we should recap a little bit because um, this like kind of brings together like the past three sessions in a way. So I thought we could just sort of introduce this functionally first so that what is active vision? Um, Grossberg in the book talk, has the uh, a metaphor, which I myself recently used in a blog post, which was, you know, the jungle predator in a jungle uh, and, and, and chasing after a prey, or, you know, you may be the prey, but in this case, I think you're the predator. And uh, he talks about some of the phenomena that you initially come across in, in, visual, in, in, the, in the descriptions of visual illusions, like maintaining boundaries across reversals of, <clears throat> of um, uh, contrast, for instance, because and so the place where you can really see all of this at play is when you're when you are moving and what you're tracking or running away from is also moving in a situation where there's lots of obstacles um, and you have to maintain at least some amount of three three dimensional order or depth order. I like this my Greek painting because it kind of plays with, plays with the whole thing and messes with that um, uh, idea of where the object is and where the gaps are. Uh, and in a sense that can break down. So consider a predator hunting in a jungle. And uh, the questions that, that Grossberg asks really well, whether you agree or not with the details of the model, I think the model actually helps you highlight certain challenges that people may not uh, necessarily think about. Like just today, I was discussing something about, someone brought up a paper about I think a rat, the mother hearing the rat pups calls and responding in some way and asked, well, where is neural representation there? And, and at first I didn't understand what the conversation was about, but I realized that they thought that somehow the, the fact that it was a pup call was directly sort of part of the auditory signal. Whereas that needs to be processed because there may be other signals that have this, a similar uh, frequency profiles. So a lot of people, I think, assume a certain things are prepackaged and given to the to, to the system of interest and what these kinds of models do is highlight the, the things that we often take for granted that need to be built uh, from fairly simple mechanism so how does a predator for instance maintain stable categories and by category we mean what is it that i like to eat right? which of those things are available now if there's multiple predators prey which prey am I going to hunt now uh, uh, and keep, keep trying to focus on? Because for instance, some predators like try to tire out a particular animal. Um, so they need to not just have a general, general idea of, of uh, all the deer are edible, you know? Um, so those need to be stably maintained as everything is moving. Um, so the categories could be learned through art, but then again, how do you stabilize the, the okay, so that's the next point, which is when, for instance, the eyes move, how can the predator tell if retinotopic visual signals belong to a new object or to a different view of the same object? This is something really, really interesting. And I think often we just don't think about it because we achieve it so well. Uh, our eyes are moving around all over the place. And typically we don't merge features of the thing that we were just looking at with the new, a new object. So these are all major challenges that Steve's sort of iteratively uh, you know, more and more complicated uh, models have tried to address. 
the computational. So, so just to recap, what was what's the phenomenological analysis? You start with some notion of basic sensors, um, and which may not actually exist, meaning that even right now there are kind of lo local interactions of some sort. So that you could kind of think of that as right before things hit the right now, what, what did things look like at, in the energetic level sense? And that gets split up in, by this prism into what we talked about before, a boundary processing system and a feature processing system. So BCS is boundary contour system and uh, FCS is the feature contour system. And just today I was asking Karthik actually, what, actually, what does Steve mean by contour? Because from one perspective, you could you could think contour just means the same as boundary, but not quite. The contours, uh, I think a better metaphor is like the like contours in a contour map. They they are more blobby <laughs> than the sh like Steve likes to talk about these. We don't see boundaries; they're kind of sharp. Um, so the contours are kind of what enable you to create both boundaries and features. Um, and they interact with each other, which is a big point. Um, and then you do this sort of multiplexing. So, so I've only put a few things here, like depth order, boundaries and things like that, but color and texture and things like that are all multiplex. So that's a part of the, the splitting, but they're all interacting in order to kind of constrain each other when this is happening, this splitting. And that uh, also has um, is fed forward in one sense to the categorization, planning, attention, all those me um, mechanisms, but those uh, mechanisms in turn are feeding back down onto, onto this process in the first place. And you see that in some of these more sophisticated visual models. And I, didn't, I don't know whether I actually mentioned this last time, but, but Steve talks about you know, the degree of co conscious awareness. I put it as a, as a kind of gradient, but he says that you know, certain things are in consciousness and certain things are not. So we don't, see the boundaries, we see the features, but there's like uh, a point at which this happens in the, in the model or where you can be reasonably confident that that's where, uh, not in terms of brain location, but in terms of, the, of processing. In, in, his, in um, it, since we talked about art, resonance states in particular are conscious states, but uh, sorry, conscious states are resonance states, but not all resonance states are conscious states. So there's some subtlety there too. So before we kind of dive into uh, how these models, these visual models kind of get more progressively elaborated, I was thinking about physical metaphors for what these models are doing. And so this is from that Gestalt um, art book, Arnheim on the left, and then it's just my magnetic filings, which is the kind of metaphor here of things in the visual field, vaguely specified as maybe what you perceive, seem to influence each other. And we're making a mechanical analog of that intuition. Um, so a very simplistic kind of uh, metaphor might be sort of something like clay, right? You, something pushes into it and you leave an impression. And if it's a, or like dough, if it's a certain kind of consistency of dough, you need press it, it eventually kind of, some, some consistencies of dough kind of um, forget <laughs> the impression. Um, and have you guys heard of non-Newtonian fluids? You must have, yes. So um, there's types of fluids and the non-Newtonian doesn't mean they violate the laws of physics, but that specifically Newton's law of viscosity doesn't get obeyed. So that means that like you have things that seem to have a consistency like water or pretty watery. And if you give it a whack, it's like you've hit something solid. Uh, uh, there's this one thing where if you place it on a speaker and keep vibrating it, uh, it will, it will um, produce standing waves and become rigid. So, so I'm thinking of this in, because of the unusual nonlinearities that um, are posited and seem to exist from just from the experimental literature, so that the impressions left produce all kinds of interesting after effects that are not simply um, decay. Like if you if you think if you use a musical metaphor like a drumhead or something, the main the main thing that happens once the impulse has been removed is a sort of smooth fall off. And, and one of the big points that Steve makes is that that's not happening in many cases. And that's something that we need to explain um, that uh, you can have sort of crisp changes when, when something is removed. Anyway, so that analysis that I talk about with that prism metaphor is constantly um, combining with the synthesis activity. So, so 
um, the com they are complementary streams. In, in what we talked about so far with this boundary contour and feature contour system is that these the feature these two patterns influence each other. Um, and here and Steve wants to make us uh, to convince us that that means that modularity is not the right term. Um, it's an interesting point. Uh, you could always sort of refactor things and say, well, I, I just mean that there's different types of information in each in different brain regions. Um, so yes, this is what Steve says, these streams are not modules because they interact at crucial stages. Um, and this point is really nice and he keeps hammering on this point, so, so he likes it too. They compensate for each other's deficiencies. So being good at one thing means being pretty bad at something else, um, which we all kind of are familiar with from just Fourier uncertainty. Like localizing the frequency of say a sound means you don't really know when the onsets and offsets are in, in the time domain. So Steve explicitly links this with um, the uncertainty principle and he calls it his own because it's more it's a higher dimensional version of, a, of that kind of thinking. Um, uh, but it's quite an analogous, I think. So, so that's a complementary stream. And there's this complementarity is just this part, uh, kind of theme that comes up again and again. And we saw one version of this in um, the differences between boundary completion and surface filling in. They sound kind of similar, but they have these differences. The boundaries sort of send out feelers towards each other, uh, whereas the surfaces are kind of, you know, well, uh, just carry on until something stops me uh, kind of thing. Uh, so that, and that's what explains neon color spreading and illusory contours. Uh, and that's the kind of one example, and it keeps coming up, this sort of yin yang of processing. Um, and so we talked about this, what the basic steps are and how they correspond with things that have been found in the visual system or national reconstructions of what has been found in the visual system. And occasionally, Rosberg made a prediction of something that ought to be found, and it seems to have been found. So you start with the stimulus, and then you have these circular and concentric on center of surround cells. Then by the time you get to V1, you have nice clean um, on um, direction sensitive cells, which you have a couple of different types. There's the contrast sensitive ones, and then you have the contrast insensitive ones, which, which um, don't care whether you have light on one side or dark and dark on the other. Um, and then you have boundary contour urines. We didn't actually talk that much about levels five and six, because it's a little complicated to understand how this all works, but we'll kind of allude to it a little bit here. I think the intuition is not that hard uh, to get. So again, just to recap, simple cells often found in V1 um, have uh, orientation preference and some limited receptive field. They like an orientation of a certain sort, um, uh, but they can't see what's happening everywhere in the visual field. Um, so this particular cell is direction, is contrast sensitive. So the gray on one side means that it likes dark on that side or, or dislikes it. Um, and you can also get act activity from dots that are collinear. And that, you know, so this diagram kind of conveys that pretty well. Um, because they are oriented local contrast detectors, they're not edge detectors. This is maybe a subtle point, but I think it's worth keeping in mind that, that what we think of as an edge may not align perfectly with contrast detectors. Uh, you might need to do some more processing in order to actually reliably catch what we think of as the edge of an object. Uh, so the next step is various types of complex cells. Um, so if you just pool simple cells that share an orientation, uh, but have opposite preferences in terms of contrast, you get a contrast invariant orientation selector. Uh, so that's an early type of invariance that has been constructed. In this case, just by adding. Um, so, the, so that's an example of an amodal, amodal orientation. So, okay. Wait. In cuts we may not need to talk about now. Um, but there are also competitions happening at various stages. So at across different positions, orientations are competing in the first competitive stage to kind of form an alignment basically across orientations in these local sort of low level, small receptive field cells. 
And then in the when cells that represent the same position in the visual field uh, are competing across orientation. So these things are happening hierarchically. So I had this idea met metaphor earlier of intra-department versus inter-department politics of it. I don't know whether I sw swapped the, <laughs> the sign of that. But yes, yeah, so this is when things get complicated, but this is what we're supposed to talk about now. So it, like I said, it's sort of an ad, but we can dive into anything that you really want uh, me or Kartik or Nico <laughs> to help elaborate on. It might not be me. Okay, so here's one example of uh, uncertainty that needs to be resolved. Let's say you have uh, a, a, bar, a bar at a particular orientation. Uh, it's a blob, it's, it's, it, you know, it has a, th a definite thickness. And you have these orientation selective simple cells that have a particular receptive field size and they can safely recognize the, um, the orientations far away from the corners. But for a sufficiently small size of, of line, which is still a thick line, uh, you may get weak um, activation of the perpendicular of this, this sort of horizontal cell. So what that means is that in, in situations where you have nice clean thick um, blobs that have orientation, you will get a kind of closure being fed up. But in some situations you'll have no activity in those orientation detecting cells. There just isn't enough um, uh, contrast there. So Steve gets a lot out, out of this because this becomes like this particular ambiguity needs to be resolved at higher level. So you can think that it's a little bit like when you look at something from a small aperture, a small window, you can't quite necessarily tell what you're looking at, so you step back. So the fact that the line end doesn't seem to have an orientation actually taps into the mechanism for how illusory um, um, boundaries form. So this is what we didn't talk about last time, which is how subsequent pooling um, of orientations occurs to give a kind of larger boundary. So you, so you could think, so yes, so this is what I said, a broader view can help decide among inconsistent local views. So what you need to imagine is that like there's many different sort of maybe little patterns of orientation. And I, when I say little, I mean corresponding to the smallest receptive fields in V1. And they may not all align with the overall shape of, of some object that you're interested say in tracking. So you mean, may need to ignore, get rid of some orientations that aren't contributing to the overall gestalt shape. And that's where co uh, cooperate, cooperation, com competition dynamics, uh, we can call say that they mediate gestalt principles uh, of selection versus suppression. And we do this all the time, right? Like when, when we see something that's like an outlier, very often we just ignore it. Um, and so this is happening sort of subconsciously most of the time. Um, oh, and we also, you know, reinforce things that do, that are sort of approximately right. We kind of uh, compensate for the slight discrepancies and make them more regular than they actually are. And that's another, then that's a big part of the top-down, the positive part of the top-down activity. So a corollary of that is that invisible boundaries and neon color spreading are consequences of uncertainty resolution mechanisms. So what in normal circ circumstances is working just fine to resolve uncertainty, these, you know, people uh, hunting around for visual illusions, find ways of, of tricking the system into sort of revealing its, its uh, handiwork in a way. That's basically the, the way that you can think about what visual illusions are good for is doing that. Um, is, is, so you have to assume that this weird thing, it's not just a weird thing, it's telling us about what the mechanism, uh, it's like the boundary conditions of what the mechanism is supposed to do. So in this particular case, we had, so you can see, you recognize steps that we've, we've talked about. The amodal orientation selection right at the bottom, this SOC filter, static orientation contrast filter, feeds into this thing called a bipole cell. Now we have to be careful because a bipole is different from a dipole, which we'll talk about soon. 
But a bipole is like a big version of an orientation uh, detector, sort of. But it may, it's a bit more forgiving. So it doesn't things don't have to be exactly uh, aligned for it to say, yes, that's what I'm looking for. So that's why it has this sort of, this uh, figure of eight shape. So various orientations that correspond to, to roughly that, that figure of eight will contribute to that cell's activity. So that, that, that's where, what we're representing with this um, loop, is, uh, is like sort of flattened alpha shape, which is supposed to be on both sides, is that this cell, if you, just, if you, if you watch the plus signs here, um, the horizontal um, detectors are contributing to, to the activity, whereas the, the opposite orientation, which in this case is, which would be 90 degrees, is suppressing it. So each cell is um, adjudicating what cells with smaller receptive fields are contributing to, um, to, the, to kind of smooth out the, the uh, orientation. Uh, a way I like to think about this is that if you look at artists, what, what, when they draw, one thing that they do much better than anybody, like amateurs who try to draw, is they'll draw rough sketches, like big blobs, and then add detail. So um, that takes some effort. So you could think that even though that's what they do first, that's not necessarily what the processing is, that they're making use of the fact that there are these higher level um, orientation blobs that we construct that you can use um, with training to guide your hand. Uh, yes. So now I'm just gonna talk about some models that kind of get elaborated. Um, so this is the basic BCS, FCS, boundary control system, feature control system that does basically static processing. And I say static, even though we already talked about the fact that micro saccades are needed for um, generating any responses from most of these cells. Um, and Grossberg is aware of that. So when he says static, he means static, including those micro saccades. So um, basically holding your gaze on, on something, the micro saccades are what allow you to see whatever that is. So it's a sort of small scale dynamic um, processing. Now, when you enhance that by adding more scales, so that you can you can explain a lot with basically a couple of like one like one small scale one big scale for say neon color spreading or boundary completion. So you need just some like one scale of that's larger and one that's smaller, and you can do a lot with that. But if you add multiple scales, I'm not sure how many, but multiple scales of that same idea BCS FCS, and then you bring in both eyes, and FIDO means filling in domain. Acronyms start to accumulate in Grossberg land. But no. so this is this pr um, progressive elaboration that, uh, that Grossberg talks about a lot. And you get something called facade, which is form and con color and depth. Form and color and depth. Form and color and depth, <laughs> which is using the same principles uh, to construct uh, an edifice. <laughs> Uh, of of how the visual system works, and so you so here with um, you'll see you know the same sorts of mechanisms, the same Lego blocks used, but you know within something larger. And this is something you have to get used to, which is that you you catch something you recognize embedded in something larger, and often it's employing a version of an idea that you've already seen before. So the nitty gritty will be difficult, mainly for anybody trying to implement it in coding. But I actually think that qu qualitatively. A lot of it is not too hard to follow. What what is what they once you kind of fix that notion of the visual field um, influencing uh, itself uh, in short and long range ways. I think that is the most important thing, and and then it becomes intuitive. What what is what we're trying to do here? So so Johan, uh, for the facade thing, uh, uh, another way to talk about it is like if you go back to that cartoon that you did with the Grossbergian phenomenological analysis, yeah. uh, you, you saw that there were boundaries and then there was surface and then there were interactive features and then they're interacting and then you get that sort of like multiplex version, right? So what facade is basically doing uh, is doing that in both scale and across features. So the features could be 
what that's what he means by form and color and uh, uh, depth and all that stuff. So it's sort of like that multiplex representation is what you, I think it was much earlier at the very beginning of yeah, the so, so it's basically that uh, that multiplexing at different scales, uh, and with uh, with binocular vision added, and also not. If, so, in the boundary contour system, feature contour system, it's sort of vague because he's not telling you what is the exact feature that is being uh, filled in. In this case, he's now saying, no, no, it's not some arbitrary feature that I'm going to be filling in. I'm going to talk about color or I'm going to talk about depth or I'm going to talk about like the form, the form being like, you know, the brightness basically uh, or sur surface luminance or uh, surface lightness. So those are basically what he would include in form and color. He'll also talk about like opponent color processing and all that stuff, which we don't have to go through, but that, that is preempted in these processes. So you can think of facade as just uh, BCS, FCS where the feature contour system is much more elaborated. The whole boundary or feature system are looked at in multiple scales. And now you also have to talk about it with binocular vision included. So it's sort of like you can add these three regimes so to get facade. So that's kind of the, the picture of what facade is. Yeah. So the general, so I, in fact, I, when you said this, I, I just, I thought about televisions, like how you initially had black and white television. And it's not that big of a jump to add color, but. I mean, there's some technical issues, which is why they didn't have color TV right to begin with. But the basic idea you kind of get with the, you know, the electron beam and the, the plates, you know, something like that is happening here, where we can try and multiplex, put more into these mechanisms and do the sort of and so on, like do that again. And where necessary, you may need to sort of share some information across streams that have been multiplexed. So what was I going to say? Yes. So the basic static BCS, static use, was used to explain neon color spreading, Craig O'Brien corn sweet effect, uh, didn't have multiple scales of boundary and feature processing. So that's another kind of thing that you kind of have to add. And so I had a, here's a question. Um, this hierarchical res resolution of uh, uncertainty, if you look, if you're really looking at it from far away, you, you start to think, well, couldn't you just average at every scale or do some sort of Gaussian smoothing? Um, and and um, uh, so you have like the most detailed and then the least detailed and then a bunch of like a sandwich of, of Gaussian smoothed um, maps and then use the highest level uh, to uh, top down pick out the, the lowest level. Uh, like are there, there must be models that are sort of like that, right? So that's the whole idea of uh, what you will call as the spatial scale theory. This is very common in computer vision, right? So, um, uh, or used to be very common, not uh, before the advent of like, you know, everything is near, near deep networks. So the basic idea with computer vision, the way like say someone like Jitendra Malik or uh, Perona would do, uh, Peter Perona would do is uh, what they would, they would do this multiple spatial scales uh, and then do anisotropic diffusion on top of it to get this representation or uh, to actually get a, a processed version of this uh, 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 objects that you're looking at. It only partially solves the problem because this is a very famous thing that I remember Eric Schwartz used to do via John Dogman, uh, which is that if you keep averaging a lot of things, you can still see it as a human being, you're able to see it. Okay, like you're, you're still able to see that that object is, you know, a blurred version of this person's face or whatever. But your edge detectors are completely gone. They can't sense any more edges in the computer vision sense. So smoothing doesn't really help you uh, if you were to talk about even in the computer vision sense, right? Like if forget about what the brain is doing. If you're com uh, continuously smoothing your data, the, the, you have to smooth your data pretty uh, drastically for you to say that what I'm seeing is a blur and it's not like some human face or an object or something like that. But like even with like a couple of uh, scales of blurring, which is what the Gaussian smoothing does, uh, most edge detectors completely tank. It's just very well known. It's like it's like a so that's one of the reasons I would say that most people who are interested in. Uh, working with respect to, uh, you know, looking at uh, building a representation via multiple scales, avoid just looking at it as a simple uh, smooth operation and then tying all of them together to get some kind of a, a, an average representation or something. So that's one point. The second point is a little more uh, ecological, which is that 
when it comes to say depth or especially binocular vision, yeah, smoothing is not really going to help. All of binocular vision for the most part is actually practically useless beyond the, uh, beyond, you know, so your grasping distance or a little more than a, your grasping distance. So if you even like make any disparity calls beyond that, people are very bad at it. Like the, we very well know that after a while, everything becomes monocular. So uh, it's more like in, in terms of the action that the human being has to perform or the animal has to perform, they're all within this grasping distance of that an, an animal or object. So that's where this binocular vision thing also comes in. So depth becomes meaningless at very, very large distances. Uh, you don't really see differences between two objects or whether they are uh, far away or nearer to one another, relatively speaking. Uh, I think, uh, I remember it for those, who is it? Uh, uh, pa pa Panum? Panum was one of the first people who did this uh, experiment where he showed like, I think like for the, the people with some of the best visual like inactivity and all that stuff, I think after like uh, 30 meters or something, people are just, it's just impossible for people to tell by just local information alone, whether one object is before or after the other, when they're placed side by side. So you'll have to depend on other global context to say what is before and what is after. So yeah, right. that's also there. The other thought that I had, which I think Steve mentions, I don't know where exactly he mentions it, but in order to get crisp um, edge, like edge detection and processing, even with filters, like just Gaussian filters, you have to pick thresholds. And picking the thresholds can actually be quite a difficult issue. Um, whereas, not that there aren't things that you have to pick in, in Grossbergian models, but you know, in principle, they're learning based on local contrast and normalizations to pick um, adaptive thresholds. Uh, that, that's kind of one of the selling points. So, now again, we've stepped one step more big now. We have the facade. And then we're going to add adaptive resonance theory and some amount of eye movement to get art scan. Um, we still not all the sorts of movement are still not included. And what you'll see, I'm not going to you know walk through the whole thing, but the point is that there are there's at least one, there's more than one art network of the sort we talked about. Um, and then there's what uh, another art there. <laughs> um, uh, that I'll talk about in just a sec. And the facade system. So we, so you can you get boundaries and features for static objects, but what happens when the eyes move? Um, that that's a big sort of. Problem. This is from one of Nico's papers. But I actually dive into one of Nico's models in detail, or maybe we'll do that later. Um, uh, so what's the shroud? This is a very interesting concept that um, Steve introduces. Um, uh, based on, you know, there's some other people who talk about similar ideas. Um, so the issue is, is related to what I said. When you shift your attention, um, how do you tell the difference between a different view of the same object and uh, a view of a new object? The conceptual idea is that, and I took this out, I think Ennio probably did this when he introduced the concept of shrouds, this, he showed maybe this statue or something like it and that painting. But the idea is that there's a, a top-down projection that conforms to the shape of the object, like a shroud. Um, quite an interesting idea. And then your movements are restricted to the shroud, your eye movements. So, so, so I just took this out of the, um, the art scan model um, abstract, actually, from Arash uh, puzzle. And, uh, and, you know, and uh, so the art scan model predicts how an object's surface representation generates a form fitting distribution of spatial attention. So to stabilize what you're looking at or attentional shroud, all surface representations dynamically compete for spatial attention to form a shroud. So I may not put it in these slides, but there's this pre-attentive process, which I think everyone who talked about attention needs because you because it's kind of a chicken and egg issue. Attention seems to be really important, but you need to get it kickstarted. Uh, so there's this first pass to have a guess of you know what is salient in the world, and we can kind of you can kind of experience catch yourself with like something that's moving quickly or something bright. You don't really know where it is, but you kind of know where to direct your attention to subsequently get better information. Um, the winning shroud, and here we're talking about instead of individual nodes competing. Where sort of distributed patterns are competing. But again, it's the same idea. 
iterated that we, we've seen in adaptive resonance theory. The winning shroud uh, persists during active scanning uh, of the object. The shroud maintains sustained activity of an emerging view invariant category representation. This is really cool. With multiple view specific category representations are learned and are linked through associative learning um, to um, the view invariant object category. So, so and you can kind of imagine that this takes time. Like you may not initially as a little kid know that this particular thing viewed from this angle is just the same object uh, and it might take a while. And so associative learning kicks in there. So uh, the, this has to be contrasted with another uh, like pre deep net model. Uh, and also the deep net models are not any different. They're probably even worse when it comes to talking about uh, a view invariant uh, representations. Mm -hmm. So this must be contrasted with what was then, uh, I mean, they also uh, called they were so, uh, I don't know, um, they thought whether it's hubris or whether they were like, they thought they were the smartest people in the world. They called them their model to be the standard model, uh, the standard model for object recognition uh, by uh, Reason, Huber, and Poggio. Uh, so this has to be contrasted with that model. Uh, so you could actually make the case that uh, this paper was also partially in response to the Reason, Huber, uh, Poggio paper, which is probably one of the most cited, uh, uh, you know, neural model paper, where if you look at what they try to do for how categories or representation for objects are formed, you will see that for every different view, for every different position, for every different rotation or translation, you are basically trying to create a category in order of sort and then trying to bind them together. So you're all you have done is you've Punted the problem of binding for different way, views or whatever invariants, uh, view invariants or eye movement invariant, or you've punted the problem to some category, uh, thousands of category nodes for a single object, and they have to somehow all to all be you know glued together to create this one uh, rich representation for uh, uh, an object. So that was how well, was the state of the art or the standard model, uh, as they like to call it. So this is, uh, you could actually say that this is Steve's way of saying like, you guys are just like complete nonsense uh, if this is how you want to model the brain. So In fact, <laughs> is... uh, I, for CN 780, Eric Schwartz's course, I read Reason Huber's whole PhD thesis as like a project with, and I discussed it with Eric because he was curious. And I said one thing which immediately caused Eric to say, I don't, okay, I don't need to pay attention anymore, which was basically mathematically what they do is take a template of some feature or object or shape and convolve the entire visual field with it. So it's like every single feature needs to be convolved with every position in space, which is uh, <laughs> bold, <laughs> let's put it that way, <laughs> as, as, as a neural model. Um, and it's also not making use of the, of the parallel nature of the brain at all in, in a way. Um, so, so the shroud, um, also helps to restrict scan. Yeah, so this is what I just said. Scanning restricts scanning eye movements to salient features of the attended object. Uh, object attention plays a role in controlling and stabilizing the learning of view specific object categories. So it's like when you have an object, along with it comes a shroud that says, "Where is the object?" And then you're safe to kind of look um, at different views of the same object and as through associated learning add them to the, to the feature that you're learning, perhaps through art, uh, if not through some other sort of group. And then art won't do all the associative learning that you need, but maybe to just form a good representation of, of what it is. Um, so spatial attention then uh, coordinates the deployment of object attention during object category learning. Um, the shroud collapse, which we'll talk about, releases a, re a reset signal and inhibits, that inhibits the active view invariant category in the what cortical stream. So if, for reasons I'm not entirely clear on, if you, your eyes move away, or you have some reason to reset the shroud, um, then you are no longer kind of keeping that category, the view invariant category active. So you could think of it like a flag is on, to say, I am now looking at this dog here. Uh, and while that's on, feel free to, to learn and associate and send that information to the dog category. When my attentional shroud breaks down, that flag goes down. It's like now the dog is not, you know, part of the story uh, of whatever you learn, learn subsequently. Um, so these are the two basic that's, things. That's not quite right, Johan. Huh. So it's that the dog may or may not be part of the story, but we're going to 
make a new pass through whether we're still learning about the dog. Ah, okay, yes, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, good. So, so just like the art uh, reset, you may actually, can you get stuck reactivating the same thing again? Uh, um, not in, not in the way we have modeled it, at least. <laughs> that, that, um, because we have, we do have, so one of the things that we, we have deliberately introduced in our models is the notion of a habituative transmitter gating. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so that's why we will not get stuck, but it is possible that if you mess with that, if let's say that someone with any kind of like a, a, a you know, a disorder, if that habituative transmitter thing doesn't work, then probably you could get stuck and you can like maybe argue about, you know, the intense work syndrome or all, all that stuff, even in that mode. So, uh, but, but we, at least in the art scan models, the suite of models, uh, we have these habituative transmitter gates that ensure that we will not be forever uh, having a shroud on just one object. After some time, we will have a collapse of the shroud, a new competition to begin in spatial attention so that another object could have its shroud formed and then we learn it. So it kind of works in that iterative fashion. So, so the critical thing is that the, the attention layers have self-excitation through a habituative transmitter. So the stronger the shroud is, the more rapidly it'll collapse. Um, uh, so, so, so you can get sort of stuck locally in a very special circumstances, but you, it's, not, it's not a general thing that, okay. that can happen. And, you know, but this, you know, doesn't deal with disorder. So, right. for example, you know, one of the, you know, major um, uh, physiological correlates of this type of mechanism is, you know, the NMDA receptor um, uh, activation uh, to that over, you know, the time course of several hundred milliseconds and which are implicated in disorders such as schizophrenia that you might get stuck. Yep, yep, yep. So this is just a little schematic of, of so what's happening. I would like to point out something about the schematic. It's a very, very important uh, schematic as far as uh, uh, you know the psychophysics or mm -hmm. the 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 what do you call it the the, the cognitive neuroscience of uh, attention goes. This is kind of based of one of probably the uh, second most famous uh, paradigms in attention, which is the the first one is the Posner paradigm that most people are aware of. This is the Egali and Driver paradigm. Uh, am I saying it right, Nico? Is it Egali and Driver or Egli and Driver? I don't exactly. Uh, Egli Driver Rafal. Egli uh, and Driver paradigm, which is that uh, you are cued to attend to some location. Let's, let's not ignore Rafal here. Come on. Oh, Egli Driver and Rafal. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's it's definitely one of the most important paradigms in terms of attention. So what they basically did was to see whether if you're cued uh, between competing objects in the visual field, uh, objects as humans define it or the experiment it defines it, and you were to cue to a particular location in an object, uh, and then after the cueing, something changes in those objects, uh, how fast are you able to react? Or that's your, because you're attending to that particular cued location, how are you able to react? But within that, you could have actually uh, made a change in something in the object, like usually a gray bar or something flashes on that part, either at the queued location or within the same object, but at, not at the queued location or in a completely different object. So this actually gives you a measure of seeing what is the, uh, you know, the attentional effect uh, to the queued location versus attentional effect to an, a point or a location in the same object, but at a different location versus shift in attention to a completely different object. So uh, that's so, so the important thing here is that the two possible non-valid cues are both are equidistant yes. from the valid cue. Exactly, exactly. So if your theory is that there is no object-based attention, then those two equidistant cues should be just as valid where if there is object-based attention, you get what's called an object-based advantage, yes. which yes. is what we broadly find. Yes. So if you look okay. at the beautiful reaction time plots and other measures that they have in the, that paradigm, it is very clear that humans have this natural ability to do this and it's not just equidistant measure. So we are not simply scanning, uh, uh, you know, like in some iso isotropic manner, the entire visual space. So once we are able to adjudicate what objects are, or you have made some sort of a segmentation, then the way in which you scan the world will differ. 
So, so I, um, I just, well, if we're discussing this task, which, which I agree is an important task, um, there are two theories about how this task, major theories about how this task, um, about why this task shows up the results that it does. So one of them is that attention spreads on objects naturally. And that has actually quite a bit of psychophysical evidence outside of this paradigm behind it. Um, and the other is that through learned experience that um, you uh, tend to, when you're tending to one object, you are going to be preferentially looking at space, uh, attending to space in that object, not through some bottom up process, but through a strategic um, allocation process. So uh, Shamstein and Yantis uh, came up with versions of this task where they played around with the probability of valid, various valid and invalid cues and um, claimed that they, that they could explain the entire object-based effect from strategic allocation of attention based on probability rather than a natural spread on objects. Uh, so, so is this related to inattentional blindness? Yes. So the, 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 some, a lot of you would have seen that video with the, the dodgeball uh, people playing and you're told- playing basketball and you have to count the number of passes. And you, you're told to count the number of times uh, uh, people uh, um, drip, bounce it or something like that. And it's like people, by six people. Yeah, the number of times they pass the ball. That have, all of you, have all of you seen this by the way? I, I hope everybody hope has. Everyone has. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll just send the video for those who have not seen if it. If you can send the video, I won't talk about it right now, but I'll give a different example because Steve mentions it and it's really amazing. This other example. I, I just um, want to finish the thought yes. before we move on. I just want to say that the Shamstein and Yentis story, while I think it's important, um, uh, Jim Brown down at Georgia did an experiment where he showed there is absolutely a bottom-up component to spreading of attention on objects. So, so the, so is that related to the pre-attentive idea? Yes. So yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the attention, there is obligatory spreading of attention on objects. You can't, you can't stop oh, it. It you only spreads ignore. on the object. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Hey and Nakayama also have some very clever experiments where they show this. Um, and they, that includes spreading of attention in depth which there was a big debate in the mid nineties about whether attentions about the relationship between the Posner idea of a spotlight of attention and whether that spotlight was actually a sphere of attention or whether uh -huh. it was 2D on the, on the visual ray. And yeah, uh, Hei and Nakayama and John Driver and some other people did some very clever experiments to show that attention spreads in depth. So this example I hadn't heard of until I read this. It's, it's the door study by the Simons lab, Simons and Levin. A pedestrian uh, provides directions to a person on the street at, as a door is moved between him and the person. Oh, oh, oh and Johan, Johan, that's, that's the same set of people who, uh, that uh, the YouTube yeah, Simons, is, yeah. the YouTube is a video that I just sent is also based on the same people. So it's for people who have not watched that video, if you watch it, you'll get to know what, what Steve's talking about. It's, yeah. So a different person who was walking along behind the door is then substituted for the first person and the pedestrian continues giving directions to the new person without no noticing that he's talking to a different person. This is totally amazing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, where you direct your attention has huge effects on what kind of information you're gathering. Okay. So I like the way this, this like I, I have a, this sort of like almost like a hobby of looking at the first line of, a, of the introduction of a paper and they're always throwaway lines, right? Like 99% of the time, it's just some banality, right? <laughs> but this, in this case, I like it. This first line of this paper is, what is an object? This I think is a very good question. Um, um, phenomenologically, what is an object? Um, accumulating evidence supports the hypothesis that the brain learns about independent views of an object coded by view tuned units. As this happens through time, neurons can respond to different views of the same object. So it's so what we're talking about. It's not like it's something Steve invented. People are talking about this in the EFIS world and elsewhere. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Sure, sure. Um, so you've been talking about the idea of a, a bottom-up spread of attention over an object. 
but I, I guess I'm confused because I, I can imagine bottom up spread of attention over a surface as defined by, you know, visual processing edges and surface spreading things. But but over an object implies that we've already learned what an object is. I mean, I can't I can't see that being fully bottom up. Um, OK, see, so I no, have a simulation not. from this model, which kind of get, get, gets at what the shroud does. So it's like you start vague uh, and kind of and that's why the shroud metaphor really is interesting. So it's like just imagine that like like imagine you're playing some weird game where you have where, where, where depending on where some loud sound comes, you just toss a veil on that. On that, but it's like that. You have some general idea of where in the visual field um, something is coming from, or the salient thing is, and then you get the, con the conforming to the shape, um, which through bottom up and part kind of the loops. Okay. So, it, so it, it, it sounds like it's it's something between like it's not just spreading over surfaces, but it's 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 doing something that you can do with just bottom up information about the visual field. Yes. No. Well, don't you need, well, I guess there's already like- uh, uh, Well, I mean, so, so- That's sort of your point though, right? That the, you, the, that... answer, the answer is sort of. Um, can't, will, buy, will this, will these shroud loops, even with eye movements, eventually get a single object under a shroud? Yes. Um, in terms of bottom up, meaning that so so this you know these whole things are you know these these recurrent loops, so you know the surface uh, the surface layer is hooked up to the object detention layer, and so as long as um, the surface that as long as a, a feature or a uh, filling in is spreading on the on the surface, it's taking attention with it in the object shroud layer. Uh -huh. So, so it's constrained by the bottom up features. And this, when you start thinking about this with, with um, cortical magnification and log polar mapping and moving the eyes around, this is non-trivial to, to do. But the, the, basically the, the ground truth of where features are spreading on a surface constrains where the shroud can be. Okay. And there's some, there's a couple of like simple simulations here that I've showed that kind of give an intuition for the temporal kind of order of all this, because there's already like bottom up and top down stuff happening to produce the, the thing that goes to the attentional system in the first place. So, um, I see. Um, okay. So, so if you, so if you look at the art scan figure, uh, unlike BCS, FCS, you will see a loop even there where in the BCS FCST would directly talk about like uh, re interaction between boundaries and surfaces uh, or boundaries and features. On the other hand, if you look at the loop in the art scan world, it's a loop between surface contour, surface, uh, the, the boundary and the surface. Uh, and the surface. Right? I have it in here. We'll get there in just yeah, a yeah. So, okay. um, And then, yeah, right. once the figure is there, it'll be easier for everybody to walk through it. So one sec. Yeah. Um, so, so here are some of the questions. Again, I really like the questions. If you do, you may not like the answer, but I like these questions. How does the brain know that the views are foveated on successive uh, on successive saccade belonging to the same object? How does the brain avoid the problem of erroneously learning to classify parts of different objects together? Um, only views of the same object should be linked. That's yeah. These questions are really good. Um, so here is like a little like one D slice in space. Um, version of this this kind of process, so you, you know, read it going bottom to top. But so it's um, early to late, three different time slices in this continuous, uh, you know, Euler simulated or whatever. Uh, so you have these inputs, which are some uh, brightness pattern, and uh, I suppose there's some initial uh, bias, uh, so that or a slight asymmetry. That means that there's an attentional map, which is this Gaussian spread, this spread kind of map. Um, and as and over time, it will change its shape. So if you look just at A, it's it's changing and conforming to the shape of the bottom-up pattern. The bottom-up pattern is, is the, constructed. Is the attention map the shroud? Is that the same? Yes. So this is a, a, a little mini example of the shroud. Uh, and so now this is um, 
it go in in the mutual mutually stabilizing uh, state, so that now it's fixed there to to that particular pattern. So there's a, a Gaussian spotlight of attention is how it starts. Uh, and doesn't the need to. Hmm? Doesn't need to. It doesn't have to be Gaussian. Is what is that what you say? It, 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 well, I mean, we use Gaussians uh, right. as a shorthand, but um, the, the upper field could be flat and just you get little jitters and one goes up and one doesn't. But you need some symmetry breaking. Uh, and so symmetry, something that's... So symmetry breaking is determined by the fact that there are different surfaces in different locations. So, so, so that's so... why the surface contour will come in for the, 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 the symmetry breaking, uh, the, 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 which will determine what you can call as the hotspot or the salient feature that you direct your eye to. I, I, so that's not shown in the schematic. I just want to note, Johan, that in this case, um, I mean, this is a toy, very toy example. I mean, this this is something that um, you know you can code in a few hours and actually get to work with, which with these models is not easy. Uh, I just want to note that once you start passing this, once you start thinking about eye positioning, positioning and passing this through a log polar filter, in any ecologically valid setting, there is no symmetry to break. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. So, but still, it's nice to know that that, that you know the, the the environment is nice to us in that particular way. <laughs> um, but yeah, the highly asymmetrical nature of the log polar map gets you a lot also. Um, uh, yeah, so that's what Nico did. Took some of these things, put them in the log polar framework, and add some more um, structure. So, when a top-down attentional spotlight remains stable through time due to persistent volitional gain control. Uh, so, what is volitional gain control exactly? Um, what is volitional gain control? That's very, it's not easy to explain. I've, I've always wondered about this. So my feeling is that in anybody's model, there, there will be this sort of deus ex machina kind of like there's something that needs to kind of get the system going or something that's outside of what you modeled that really helps <laughs> in, in just for something or the other. So vol volitional gain control basically um, is, is, is the object you are is whether the object you are learning about relevant to your current behavioral drive or not? Did you look at the right thing or the wrong thing? So, so okay. you, can, you can kind of make a very, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, caricature is version of it, even in these schematic figures in the sense that uh, the fact that uh, not only do you get a form fitting of the attentional map or the shroud to reflect the surface, what you see is that the other surface which it was competing with has kind of gone down, mm -hmm. right? Like so, it's sort of like this. You can you can you can re even at a very very uh, caricaturish level, you can think of this persistent volitional gain control as saying that oh, I'm seeing this thing, so I better have a bet. You know, there is more contrast enhancement of the object that I want to see at the cost of other things. So you can think of that as well as a way for uh, volitional gain control because this has already been shown by most people in neurophysiological studies, right? Like this is one of uh, Bob Desimone's claim to fame that you know you can act, you can actually like for the object that you're interested in attending, you're increasing its contrast enhancement and everything else goes down. Uh, and then Marisa Carrasco has shown the same with humans as well and uh, in psychophysics experiments. So uh, we can kind of say that that's part of the persistent volitional gain control, but uh, Nico is right about it in general. Like what would, you know, in an ecological setting cause this thing is up to you in terms of what your behavior is driven towards. So that will okay. partially. So I suppose mathematically you can say that systems that are not explicitly modeled here will be part of what Sometimes this model is just a local feedback loop. So maintenance of, of something, the kind of hold, and to, to use the attractor metaphor, like the depth of the, the basin of attraction, uh, you can just use local um, self-excitation to kind of hold it right, in place. It'll stabilize it yeah. if you have that. Yeah. But you might need that, that what we just put as a self-excitation might actually involve like, yeah, there's other things. Well, uh, so that's, that are, that's, that's definitely true. So in, 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 in fact, like, not in the art scan like models. So that loop that you're talking about, 
becomes like an entire set of brain area, like you know, brain areas or something. Like if you look at Matt Silver's work, especially when he does all the stuff with respect to supplementary eye fields and how do you like decide where you have to plan ahead from one location in your eye movement to the other. That one single loop, which Steve talks about in general, is elaborated into an entire prefrontal cortical network that you have to go through. So that's kind of his model as well. So uh, you will see that iteration as well. For convenience, in our case, at least in art scan like at least in Nico's model or my model, we have all like assumed that there is this feedback that is coming some somewhere or in this case is self-stabilization. But it is always, on the other hand, if you look at say, oh, I forget his name, uh, Andrew, uh, who was working with me, he had to like have the signal come in from the wear pathway uh, so that he could do the search more effectively. He was mm -hmm. doing the visual search problem. So it required a lot of prefrontal as well as uh, parietal areas to actually kick in to cause this, uh, you know, where this loop is coming from in terms of like self-stabilization or removing the self-stabilization. Right. So, yeah. So, so like e ecological validity is a simple um, phrase for a very complicated thing, right? Which is based on what am I, what I'm doing? Should I, you know, double down on what, what I'm attending to or not? Yeah, I, I mean, in, in all of these models, it's, it's uh, assumed to come out of a basal ganglia mechanism yeah. that up or down, uh, up regulates or down right regulates inhibition, the overall strength of inhibition, inhibition in these maps. In the through the cortical, yeah, and that's a solid. I, I, I think it's a very solid assumption to make that the basal ganglia is doing that. Um, so. And, and since we published this, like Okahita Hikosaka has come up with some pretty interesting evidence about that supports this idea. Yeah. So, so, so now you see a version of, of resonance, surface charge res resonance, which should ring a bell. Uh, so be between what, what is, is being processed, like we see the surfaces, that's what we see. And, and the attentional sharp, there's some, you know, like, okay, this fits. Um, so just as a summary of what's happening here, the BCS uh, boundary and surface process processing gives us filling in boundary formation, contrast enhancement, cortical magnification also. And then from there, there are these two streams. The wear pathway, which is uh, particularly interested in boundaries, as we saw, um, forms attentional shrouds and resolves competition between different object surfaces. This is really important, transforming between retinotopic and head-centric coordinates. It's kind of complicated, so we might not be able to talk about it, but really important. Um, select the next saccade, yes, move, move to something else. Uh, like if there are hot spots within the object, like trying, it's like, remember those Yarbus pictures of the person scanning different types uh, of uh, information within the same photograph? It's related to that idea. And contrast enhanced line ends or corner features to create hotspots. That's so with it, like the high information zones are often where there are even within an object, high contrast. So you um, can think of, so again here, the, the last two points in the wear stream are uh, important. So in the regular models that say Nico did or Arash did or I did, we were looking at contrast enhanced line hands or corner features to create these hotspots. On the other hand, the, the people who say want to do a visual search or have a goal, a particular goal in mind, okay, the selection of the next target for um, hotspots is very, it could vary depending on the goal that you have in terms of where you want to move your eye. That's what you saw with the Arbus experiment, right? Uh, look at all the, uh, uh, scan the, scan the room for all the portraits of the humans in the paintings or scan the room for where, uh, for wealth or something like that. So that goal direction will, will change the nature of hotspots, but in the absence of it, uh, the regular art scan models, that's what kind of what Nico and others we have created, is to look at like how, you know, a naive system will go about looking at like, you know, I've looked at this, so how do I sequentially like do the eye movements and move from one object to the other and so on. I, I would just like to point out some, some later work that I did with Jackie Gottlieb. Um, uh, Foley, Kelly et al. showed that LIP encodes expected information gain independent from reward expectation. Nice. So it, this, this idea is not just, you know, a low level idea of contrast enhancement. I mean, the, the, the idea that information gain is a core thing that your brain, mm -hmm. that monkey brains can compute and is represented in these areas that we know have uh, spatial maps. Um, is, I mean, it's, it, it's there. 
So yeah, so in the what stream, by, uh, by contrast, you have learning the names of objects. So that will involve art map, which is supervised learning, which you haven't really talked about yet. Um, you link several view in sensitive category cells to one view invariant object cell. So associative learning more or less, which is features that are, and, and nodes, category nodes that I've collected from, from one view are related to these others. Once I am permitted to, by, by virtue of there being kind of the master category active at the time, and learn object views. I, I um, would be very careful using the word associative learning. Well, Steve used it, right? So uh, I know, I know, but he uses it in a way that nobody else in the field uses. Oh, really? Okay. His, so, his version of associative learning is would not be called associate. Or let me put it this way: what everybody else calls associative learning is not what Steve's version of associative learning is. There's more than just heavy and. Oh no no no! It, it Steve deliberately. Hebbian learning is not associative learning in Steve. Okay. Um, oh, I suppose you, uh, well, we'll get to that when we get there, like competitive queuing and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. What learning role does he mean when he says associative learning? Um, so this, so, so this, so this gets into uh, the instar outstar stuff. Um, but basically, um, associative learning is uh, learning that leads to resonant states um, oh, oh. in Steve land. I know that's not the clearest explanation. I would have to think about it a little bit more to try to unpack that. He, he might get to it in some future chapter. He hasn't actually expanded on it yet. But how can that be computed locally without doing something like heavy and learning? It, it, it install and also contain a Hebbian component and an anti Hebbian component. So it's it's actually like this Hebbian in there. It's just not the the category nodes themselves. Hebbian so learning in Steve. Another way of saying this is in Steve world. Hebbian learning is insufficient for to create associative learning. Right. So Hebbian plus anti Hebbian and a few additional uh, assumptions um, about competition among um, categories and things like that. Uh, will be part of the story. I, I, it gets very messy for higher order stuff. But... So, so, okay. yeah, so here's I mean, the diagram. Here's the diagram in case you want to pick no, anything out. No, 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 do not focus on this diagram. Oh this my diagram. God, why did you put this diagram? Oh, <laughs> Just God. to scare the daylights out of everybody. Okay, but, then I should... uh, <laughs> if you're going to do that, put up the full Telos thing. I mean, come on, <laughs> Mohan. <laughs> anyway, so. I just um, what, what, so this is again more or less what we've what we've already kind of walked through, um, but what yeah, you'll notice that reset is very important. So you know we're following along, doing all these different things <laughs> with mechanisms that we've already talked about mostly, but reset we haven't actually talked about. We mentioned gate, gated dipoles, but and habitu habituative synapses. So now these little dashed lines depleting transmitter. I want to zoom in on that. So, so reset. If you think about it as as like something that just gets turned off, you might, if you remember the the Newtonian liquid metaphor or the drum head, you might expect things to kind of fall off gradually. If it was just like the thing that makes this thing active is off, then you might expect some kind of fall off, especially if there's local um, excitation in a, in an ensemble. I, but I, you want a clean reset. Um, so Johan, in fact, before you. Go get into that. Can you just go back? I just would like to point out something that is important in conceptually in Steve's idea of the what where, which is that the what stream has no ability to tell the where stream when attention should shift. Why? What if I'm looking at something and it reminds me of something else? Like from internal. I'm just saying in these models, the so, so where stream to... tells the what stream what what is what is happening in the world because and the world right, stream because, has no veto power what, what, so the, the, spatial, the spatial one has the veto power in this model okay. on the other hand if you have a specific thing that in mind which is what uh, andrew was doing which is that he was trying to do a search thing like the various waldo problem that he was trying to do in that case you'll actually have to have a feed, feedback from the what, what pathway to the where pathway as well. So in this simpler model, it's almost like, a, think of it as an autonomous roaming uh, individual rather than like someone who has goals and all that sort of business. Think of this as an explorer of the world. <laughs> a flannel. Uh, well, no, so, so, 
So yeah, so this is an explorer model, yeah, and yeah, where, where you can turn. You, there is an exploiter mode when you put a further top-down thing on top of this. Thing. Yes, the SX machina will never be avoided. Um, but uh, okay. So you have so, uh, if, if for, you, I, you will go through the gated. Day, I want to go through something that's actually very low level and so simple that if I, I, you can like if you know how to implement differential equations, you can implement it tonight. And so it won't even in take fact, you that long. In fact, uh, the, the reason why uh, once you finish this, uh, maybe uh, you can. Uh, I, I don't know whether like uh, uh, Arash or Nico actually had shown it in their paper in that like, level of time course. What I had done is I had actually taken a slice of this whole reset mechanism to show how sharp the reset is in my paper with Steve. You'll mm -hmm. see that once the reset becomes really sharp, uh, the attention shroud collapses like immediately, and the next one starts immediately. You'll see the entire temporal domain of it. Uh, yeah, in, so in I, a one D slice. You could dig that up, but but yeah. but you'll see it in this toy thing also. Um, uh, Arash, Arash had I don't know whether he showed it in a figure, but he definitely talked about it. Um, my model uh, did not need I, reset. So I, I, I'm very sure thing. that's why that's why Steve forced me to do it in that one D version <laughs> to show people that you know this is exactly what happens. You you yeah, we can talk about it later. Okay, but it you, it'll be clear as soon as we get through this. So. So this is a gated dipole. It's a, it's a little simple circuit motif um, uh, that I, I don't know whether you could actually like, show it anatomically ever, but but it's it's very simple. You have cells that receive two cells, uh, two sort of streams. One that's sort of representing one feature, and the other that's representing a complementary feature, and they are uh, mutually inhibiting each other in this feed forward kind of way. And they all have, they both have a common um, input, which you could think of as like some sort of base baseline, keep everything active or arouse sort of input. And this becomes really important actually. And we assume that this P, so yes. Examples of features would be like an orientation or a color, right? Right. So the orientation one Isn't way and the one 90 degrees opposed to it could be an example of a channel like this. Or in color opponency, a color and its opposite color. And you can cash this out in many ways in other, like he's used this in so many places. So for instance, in art, we talked about reset, but I didn't actually get into this, but this is what uh, will do this. So a category is that that's one will reset itself because through complement coding of, of this sort so that it can time itself out um, for a while uh, as soon as its driving input disappears. So, so there's this P is breaking the symmetry between these two. If, 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 and as you will see from the simulation, this is what I sent out the, um, the collab, the Python code. So this you have to read top to bottom. Um, uh, I just did two, two different input levels. I, I, did, I spent a little time tweaking parameters, but they're probably not the ideal parameters, but you get the basic idea that this is the just P since I is common to both streams. I, I didn't show it, it's constant. Um, and when P, P uh, is onset, uh, this, this first step becomes active and this inhibits the other cell. Uh, so you, uh, you see that the, the other cell in the, in the next level. So the fact that this is a, the blue, blue line is active means that this orange line is going down. That's orange is this side and blue is this side. And the habituative synapse or the depressing synapse is uh, controlled by, there's a thresholded decay, meaning that if the activity is above, I think I chose six or seven or something, um, then it starts to uh, fall, fall. So it's like, it's tired of being the winner. So blue is like, okay, I won, but I, I'm bo getting bored of this. Um, but because the situation hasn't changed, it's maintaining a certain amount of activity which suppresses the other. Now, as soon as the offset happens the this is still inhibited so it, it can't actually fully respond to its input for the other cell by virtue of being hyperpolarized it's fully capable of responding to the to the, the constant input i so it kind of swings up and um uh is uh, so there's like a rebound it's like a post inhibitory rebound that that is a is um an emergent phenomenon of interaction. So it's not an intrinsic phenomenon of, of any one cell. Although in neurons, we have seen that, uh, or and in Hodgkin-Huxley models, for instance, that 
post inhibitory rebound can also be modeled using local internal um, channel dynamics, like there's a low threshold calcium channel that will do the job. So there are other ways of implementing this basic idea. Um, so uh, this is showing the full activity, including the hyperpolarized part. But if you just look at what's, a, what's positive, which is what can affect things downstream, you see that it, it, it keeps track of the onset and very sharply uh, the, the original input gets turned off and this rebound turns on. So that gives you an intuition to the sharpness of reset. But where this becomes, where this is really used in all those different places in, in these models is that the, the, the other channel contributes to uh, inhibition in, in these uh, competitive networks. So, so uh, the idea for all these, uh, you know, the sh surface shroud resonance in terms of like shifting of attention and one shroud losing and the other shroud winning is all based on this light motif of uh, gated dipoles. But again, like, like uh, Nico said, once you add the uh, log polar, once you add uh, how, you know, the thing doesn't, is no longer trivial in the same way, once you start re talking about like actual, like, you know, uh, images and 2D objects or whatnot, and you look at like uh, onset drop surrounds of like various objects and different uh, features and all that stuff, the competition uh, is pretty tricky. It's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's nowhere near a non-trivial uh, 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 mechanism to uh, actually implement. It's pretty easy to do this, like uh, for just two inputs by one, you know, where I is some tonic input and P is just some, uh, you know, a small bump. But imagine now that this P is now replaced by an entire image, which is what you're feeding into no longer X, but an entire, uh, you know, a network of nodes, which have in competition with one another and they're partially cooperating as well. And then it has to go further and further. And there is also top-down feedback uh, and self-excitation, <laughs> you can get like pretty crazy. You have to be very, very, uh, it, it's finicky. You have to be very careful. This is not a, a yeah, this, system to actually work at all. It's um, coming really up with, with a network where the shroud is restricted to a surface, but is not a point, so, which is to say not winner take all, is a pretty fine balancing act. And um, it's, it's there there are a lot of different sort of factors that go into it i managed to get it running over a high range of contrasts um rosh had to use a very limited range of contrasts um but as karthik points out once you introduce all these other nonlinearities, i mean keeping a network in a state where it uh, one group can win but it's not doesn't compress to one person or doesn't blow up uh, and, and, and you know, there are, so for example, my, our explanation of crowding is that the shroud inappropriately expands to another object and therefore you can no longer differentiate them. So yeah, but the, 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 the big challenge here is, is less conceptual than it is in finding the parameters and making it um, a robust across a lot of different conditions. Uh, no, 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 no. It is not just a challenge with respect to parameters. That's an entirely uh, different problem and it'll, it's there all the time. It's like unavoidable, but that's, that's not the thing. The, the thing is you're expanding what this X is. You're expanding what this P is. You're expanding what your w, WX is. These are, this is sort of like a, uh, how do you call it? This is like a boiled down version of what a gated dipole is. Also known as a microcosm. Yes. Yeah. So this is a microcosm. So once you actually <laughs> enlarge everything, it is the, the, the macrocosm that you have has a lot of uh, insane uh, uh, degrees of freedom on yeah, yeah. what we have. So you have to be very, very yeah, careful yeah. there. Yeah. 100%. Like, like taking anything that's happening in points and turning them into continuum phenomena or like distributed phenomena always comes with issues. And just even design issues, like topological design issues, the, uh, apart from param parametric issues. So, and, and this, this even goes back to the competitive cooperative loops. I mean, Kar Karthik can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, Rushi Bhatt is the only person that got more than two directions working in a yeah, competitive Yeah, group. definitely. He got four. <laughs> no, we had eight. He got it up to eight. He had eight, right. He had eight. It is pretty stunning. He had eight. 
Uh, if you go for continuous direction changes, it's like almost impossible, like, uh, like just as a challenge, because it's sort of like you really don't know how to set up the competitor, uh, cooperation competition loop. It's sort of like uh, it kind of breaks. You don't know where the, the, the change starts and ends. Mm -hmm. If you ask a human being, they'll tell you like between two directions, they'll tell you easily, yeah, this is different. But like when you start doing it, it's not clear. So it's, uh, there are issues here, uh, implementation level issues. Which may be pointing I, to the need to supplement this with, with some other machinery. Uh, well, no, no. So how Rushi got it and what saves you is peak shift. If you get it just right, you peak shift. So you create a, a little, you create a bifurcation, essentially, uh, a local okay. bifurcation that puts that, that recategorizes everything. So, yeah. So, so moving a little bit from this particular set of models to something again, a little simpler that you can, you, you can think about with this, this particular Lego block um, is after images. So you guys have probably seen this, spend a couple of seconds looking at, at this and then like move your eyes somewhere else. I'll leave it here for, for a little while. You can either just move it or I'll shift to a white um, thing subsequently. And you should see if you look long enough, complementary after image, quite something. And you'll, you'll be able to tell that it's in retina uh, topic coordinates just from the way that it follows wherever you're looking. Um, and uh, yes, works really well for me. Um, so here are some others that he, he, he talks about with um, Greg Francis. Now this one didn't actually work all that well for me, which was a little bit size and position and other things dependent. But here, we'll just see what if see what you get and describe it. I won't I won't prompt preempt you. Uh, we we definitely require the non uh, CNS people to answer here. Now, right, all, right. Yeah. So so um, to, to me, it almost looks like a a sphere with a close dot and then like contours making it farther away. It's like a, a half dome that you're staring at. The okay, that's good. I sometimes just get a negative version. Yeah, some sometimes it's just a inverted asterisk. What I what you should get it is an expanding circle. Yeah, that doesn't. I don't see that. Did we lose Johan here? I think he must have froze. Yeah, I oh. think he froze. I think he froze. He may have to reboot his computer. Yeah, it's fine. He's just staring at it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's trying to get all. He's kind of trying to get the best after image of like uh, after like so much of staring. Yeah, high quality after image. Oh, yeah, his computer crashed. He just uh, he just emailed uh, message me. That's uh, fine. Uh, Kale will be the host automatically, so that's how it works. Re record is off. So yeah, I think he crashed. No, 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 it's still recording, but uh, he can always edit it back later. So uh, it's not a big thing. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, he'll just oh, cut really? this. It still out. records even when the person who's recording crashes out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He can always edit, he can always edit the parts out later. So he has the option of like uh, going through the entire time video and then saying like I don't want these minutes. I don't want these minutes. Like he can selectively edit parts. Uh, so. Anything that we say controversial, he can easily edit it out. <laughs> I'm curious what other people saw. It's like, so for, for example, me, it's like here. it flickers between the, the asterisk being inverted, just a, instead of a black asterisk, I have a white asterisk. And then I get the like circle, the like mi middle dark that's a circle. And it's kind of like a so deep, this is something almost like I a depth. This is something that I've actually talked to Greg Francis about. I've actually told him, like, because I met him in a few conferences and all that. Uh, I told him, like, this is one of the very few uh, illusions where I don't see any after images at all, like that the one with the spikes. I don't see anything after staring forever. The so with, with that particular one, it really helps if you, um, uh, if you, well, I mean, I, for this, you know, I have to be in, in like this. Uh, you want it. You want it to be around five and a half degrees of your visual field. If if it's only foveal, you won't get the the image. Ah, uh, okay. So it has to be big enough. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, no, you, you, you want it to be like five and a half or six degrees. Yeah, I couldn't see it sitting over on my couch or sitting here. You could? I couldn't. Oh, no, you couldn't. No, 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 it has to be extraphobial. This, this particular after image is, has to be extraphobial. For some reason, my computer is very slow. Oh. I'll try and get back. Just a sec. I don't know what's happening. It's fine. It's usually, it usually happens to me, but this is like one of the times that it's happened to him. Uh, is it freezing? No, you're, you're okay now. You're at least back. It's a little slower, but it's okay. My PowerPoint is, is also like freezing up. Yeah, and your uh, video is very uh, stuttered. Yeah, weird. Well, I only had a few more things. But... But yeah, but, but people should ask any questions in the meantime. So uh, if, before Johan can set up stuff. Then. I see where is. I guess I'd, I'd be interested to um, understand, like just broadly, how much, uh, how many different types of uh, visual illusion there are, and um, how many. How many of those are sort of like explained in the Grossbergian world and how many of them are sort of mysteries? Because I, I, I don't have that big view because the way it gets presented in the book, it's like, you know, every single illusion has this obvious explanation and you sort of wonder, well, are there illusions that can't be explained or, you know, that that would be uh, interesting to know? Good question. I don't know. Very good question. I don't even know how to start answering it. It's sort of like really, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say like, uh i would say like the more modern like there are some like if you take a look at like the you know there is this yearly competition for best illusion of the year and all that stuff like this is one hosted by uh susanna martinez condi and uh, uh steve macknick uh, i think it's called the best illusion of the year usually they have like a wide variety of like uh, uh illusions that they present and then the like, top 10 are chosen and then the top three are like given a cash prize and all that stuff uh I would say a large part of, part of them can at least be explained by some of the theories that Steve has talked about. I don't want to say that you can immediately solve it. If again, some of them might be non-trivial in terms of implementing and showing that it works or doesn't work, uh, but you at least might have an intuition based on what he has done through this entire book, at least a vision part of the book to say that you can at least bring them all under the framework. But I would say something like this crazy, uh, what's the, 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 the crazy illusion on the mirror where like you're turn, turning the object in the mirror suddenly makes it look like a cylinder and then makes it looks like a square, square. Uh, you know, uh, that those might be one of those things that might not be very easy to <laughs> replicate in any of Steve's model. Uh, at least I can't think of one. Uh, I think it was called the ambiguous uh, shape or ambiguous cylinder or something. It was one, it was the winner like a few years back. Uh, and then, you know, you also have like uh, uh, Akiyoshi, what's his name? Uh, oh, yeah. Every day he seems to post a new oh illusion. My God. He's like a machine <laughs> for illusions. It's like stunning. Like, uh, like you have to just give that guy a special award, you know, find a Nobel Prize or something for that guy for coming up with all these illusions on a daily basis. It's just stunning. Um, uh, so Most yeah. of them, when I look at them, I do like naturally gravitate towards some sort of Grossbergian thing involving these these dipoles and opponent processes and things like that and and the you know hierarchical resolution uh yeah it's a, it's tough to know because like like it's like coming up with random contraptions and asking well does the, does the laws of physics explain this it's like you know how what do you that that's like uh simultaneously uh very difficult and also it's not clear why you would want to do that um, but yeah, obviously this is not anything like the laws of physics, but uh, you have to uh, be a limited. Well, well, I think, I think it's, it's interesting to, um, to like push it in that direction, right? To say, well, um, the, the approach that Gosberg seems to use is to look for these dilemmas that come out of an illusion, right? Like you look at, there's something, there's something um, strange going on that demands an, an explanation that's non-obvious. And, and I guess the, the question to you guys is, you know, do you currently have those sorts of dilemmas where you say, oh, there's some 
visual illusion which doesn't fit with the model so we must be missing some aspect of the mechanism some mechanism or we and, and it sounds like no right because you're talking about his law so that's a useful answer to me right it, it sort of gives me a feeling of how confident you are in the, the sort of um macro i'm not as confident as i would be in newton's laws but or like, <laughs> um or like you know whipping out uh the you know uh, path integral for like all the you know lagrangian formulation in physics for the problems for which that is is recommended but uh that's what i start with and uh there is and i haven't been keeping track of you know the constant production of illusions uh so but do we maybe we can think about that and keep track from as we go forward Here's a, here are some classic illusions. I don't know whether this works for you or is, is it showing anything, but the, the one on the left is the phi phenomenon. So it's they're changing the interstimulus interval of the two bars and it, at the fastest speed, uh, it should look like it's moving from one, to, one side to the other. And if it's not, just look for phi phenomenon on Wikimedia. Uh, inside Wikimedia, there are a few examples. These are, that's where I pulled this from. So if you pull it up on your browser, you'll see. This one is super cool, the color um phi illusion which shows that the the for, for i think opposite colors you don't even need the the object to have the same surface feature uh, in order to get the subjective feeling uh, of motion it still depends on the interstimulus interval and then there's a super weird one so this one uh yeah that's just the basic seems to be moving from left to right and this one it looks like the the illusory oh. square is what is moving, uh, which I find quite quite awesome. It, it's almost like yeah, exactly in the domain of of Grossberg style models. Um, so you you th that's where I would start to, to think about what's happening here. But what are we what are we getting at the notion the processing of motion? Let's just repeat the slide. So one question is uh, if this odd quirk exists so it's like nothing is moving it's just something flashing from one point to the other why does it exist why is it possible for this to happen uh same sort of thinking uh, what 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 can we learn about natural system from these odd odd unnatural systems situations and getting back to this i like this explanation a lot which is that in in the dappled world of the jungle uh things will pass in and out of light or behind um, trees and things like that. So for certain time scales, you want to keep track of something uh, moving when it when you no longer get direct signals uh, of its movement. So and next time you're in a forest, like think about this. It's it's really interesting um, that that that's quite useful. Um, so he talks about this here. Um, there's a very like a sort of the trivial approach to thinking about movement is that there is a motion picture going on in your brain, right? And this is half a step from the homunculus, right? Because, uh, and also from things like Zeno's paradox, or especially Zeno's arrow's par arrow paradox. Like if you have a, a sequential set of images, however you define image in, or even neural pattern, even a sequence of neural patterns that are mutually exclusive doesn't really give you what you want um, in terms of that, that illusion. And also this naturalistic idea of things passing behind trees and stuff like that. So there's an active construction going on. Object motion is not just a temporal succession of shifting static form representations. Um, and within this, there's some interesting kind of quirks. There's this thing called motion ESP. Um, if a more intense flash follows a less intense one, then the perceived motion can travel backward from the second flash to the first. Steve is really good at this type of like picking out these kinds of quirky things from the, from the psychology literature. Again, you don't have to buy the explanation necessarily, but the fact that he draws attention to them is really cool because they, here's where the, in, the philosophical interest and the interest for phenomenology and things like that becomes quite interesting because you have some objective measurements of what the timing is between different images, for instance, and you, you can still get a strong subjective feeling. Like in the red uh, and blue motion, I like the 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 the, the, the gif that they that they provided of the blue to red because they have enough of a gap between them so that that you know that you're not sort of going perceiving the motion because of a repetitive cycle over and over again. It's it's in one direction only, but 
if that red dot was not there, we would not have seen any motion. But you, you seem to think to feel as though the motion started when the blue dot disappeared. So this invites a fair amount of thinking about when experience is taking place. Uh, I, I don't think from a philosophical or introspective perspective, there's an easy answer to this, but some version of the idea that what you're doing is living a little delayed helps a little, but not always, not completely. Uh, also, it's borderline nonsensical based considering the isomorphistic assumption that, uh, 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 that Neukrosberg works with. Um, so this, uh, so how does the brain know that a second flash will occur after the first flash shuts off? In this case, the motion goes in the opposite direction. But even in the blue to red, there's this time traveling quality to, to this effect. Um, so rather than simply positing images in a sequence or neural patterns, discrete neural patterns in a sequence, um, you have to accept the idea of movement having dedicated processing. In fact, originally I wrote movement is represented. Um, so uh, it's well known that some regions of visual cortex are, are specialized for motion processing, notably MT. So there's a nice little short video with Nancy Canvisher talking about this too. Uh, and she's like, we know this is a visual area and we know this, it's very you know, clear about it. And she mentioned some nice data. Um, um, MT is, is a, has cells, the thing they first in monkeys found that they very much like direction of motion, a little bit like certain cells in B1, but more so. And you can identify them even with um, fMRI. In this case, um, a moving cast shadow. So things that are definitely of more um, gestalt interest. Uh, and interestingly, she pointed this out. I just found this out recently that the um, TMS uh, of those areas, v MTV5, disrupts perception and storage of the motion after effect. So there really is a place that seems to be keeping track of motion. So uh, Grossberg started thinking about this after reading Kohler's. I haven't looked into that, but I'd like to. Um, uh, so observed mental, yeah. So the study of apparent motion in the early 20th century is, is a good evidence um, for the, the idea. Observed mental construction of a non veridical motion path epitomized the constructive aspects of the human mind. So we're not simply collecting events, we're constructing sort of uh, patterns inferred and uh, from, from them. So how this is modeled uh, is, again, sort of intuitive, although in the details, it's, you have to kind of read it on your own, but uh, there's a, in addition to what we just talked about, BCS, FCS, and even multi-scale BCS, FCS, you have to start thinking about motion as having dedicated processing. So you go through levels that are similar in, in a way to the hierarchical processing, but level four, five, two, five is, is quite important. There's a long range Gaussian filter. So what it does in space is kind of, it's a little bit like the BCS, the, the boundary contour system, but for motion. It's like motion cells are putting out feelers in this, in a Gaussian way to be like, to, to look for patterns that are consistent with a global motion. Um, so you have this long range interaction, which, on top, which then has a sharp uh, contrast enhancement and winner take all. And so what this looks like in simulations is that, so here they're regulating the size of these Gaussians and showing that uh, almost in a, you know, literal minded in the sense that the activity corresponds to the percept of something moving and specifically in a specific location with a specific direction. Um, and that is the, this pattern in these two. So the space is on the um, X and time on the Y in these, these plots. And this is a parametric exploration of when and, and why the time matters for this. So the size of the, the spatial size of the Gaussian and the interval between the two matter quite a bit. The sort of thing, it has a sort of surface plausibility, but you really have to dig in on to, to look at the subtleties. Um, so that's really kind of all I had. Um, the I, This isomorphistic Assumption Todorovich. I, I, I would just like to point out another little subtlety about the motion stuff, which I, I mean is going to be of limited interest to some people. Um, but Johansson, in his um, so motion record the way we um, the way the way our brain computes motion requires a reference. 
So um, this guy, Gunnar Johansson, um, wrote this book, which I'm trying to figure out when, the, in 1950, where he um, put people in totally dark rooms. So absolutely black. And then he gave them point sources of light and he varied them in certain ways and basically showed that you were totally unable to come up with uh, vertical explanations for what was happening with the actual points of light if you did not have a reference and the points were in motion. For those who are interested, it's called configurations and event perception. Cool. So it's a little bit like a sort of motion gelb effect or something, huh? Yeah, exactly. Cool. So yeah, I, I, that's all I sort of put together. I think I changed something and then when it crashed, <laughs> this last bit was not saved. Um, if if anybody would like back. the book, I can send a PDF of the book. Okay. I can send it to them. It's it's 38 megs. So I think it's a little large for the chat. Google, uh, Google Docs, Google Drive. Um, yeah, if anyone wants me to go back to any slides or diagrams or anything we can, otherwise I'll exit this. I mean, there's a lot more to the motion story here. We have not. Really oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a whole uh, lot happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the only thing I would like to say here is uh, in those early models with. Uh, so you will see again a sort of refinement that Steve goes through even in these sort of motion models later with other people. So you can think of the work that he that Johan showed here with uh, Mike Rudd is sort of like the early version of the BCS FCS model. But like once you start adding in like the the issue that Nico is pointing out here, which is that if you don't have a reference or the gestalt is notion of like you know the, the environment in which you are in, which will involve like optic flow and all that stuff, you have to introduce entirely new machinery as well into the system to actually say like how you're able to perceive like you know a bird flying or an object moving, and then how you're able to deliberate about the speed of an object. Who, uh, what, uh, Nico, remind me who did that? Is it, was it uh, uh, Krishna who did that? Krishna Govindarajan, who did that like whole uh, speed perception of objects, if I remember correctly? For Krishna. Yeah, it was Krishna, right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, if you look at his models, you will see like it's the equivalent of like the facade model where he has added like more <laughs> architecture and more infrastructure for you to process like you have to look at the global local relation uh okay. it's not a simple like a dot moving like you know for him to explain this fee phenomenon because in the fee phenomenon you don't really have any global information so you can get away with it like what he has done with paul Rudd and the uh, not paul Rudd. Uh, why did i say paul Rudd? <laughs> <laughs> I say Paul Rudd, Mike Rudd, uh, uh, <laughs> talk about uh, traveling uh, gravitational, not gravitational, the G waves. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, to double dip on that metaphor, it's like the the, the artist sketch, sketch, right? So early mo models of Grossberg are like those blobby kind of rough sketches. And then you add up more of these little, little details, which are a bit more fiddly, a little harder to get right. And that's how it is with this kind of modeling. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now and...